Maximus 4 Extreme. This is a P67 motherboard. It is evidently designed for overclocking. It is part of the Republic of Gamers brand from ASUS. It supports the latest Intel Core i7, Core i5, and Core i3 processors, if for whatever reason you're putting a Core i3 on Extreme motherboard, which you shouldn't be doing. Um, on the LGA1155 platform, it features the Intel P67 chipset, it is fully SLI ready and ATI Crossfire X ready, although that should probably be called AMD Crossfire X at some point. It features the iDirect, which is, hold on a gosh darn minute, a Bluetooth, no. Well, you know what, we'll get into that later. ROG Connect, which I am familiar with, so you use a USB cable to plug into a third-party computer using a utility to overclock your PC. 3 d Mark Vantage is included. 10 USB 3.0 ports, two at the front, eight at the back. Uh, we've also got a Bluetooth module accessory card, which is included. ROG Connect, which we talked about already, supports three-way SLI and Crossfire X, so not four-way, but three-way is just plenty for an LGA1155 socket anyhow. I mean, remember, the CPU only has 16 PCIe lanes built into the, uh, the controller anyway. Oh, you know what? I haven't showed you the whole package yet. There we go. So more of the same information here. Uh, oh, okay, iDirect, here we go. Tune your PC from your iPhone or iPad now. <laughs> nice. Just in case you want to. Extreme Engine Digi Plus, so that is a uh, powerful combination of analog and digital design elements for the VRM. There's the motherboard itself. Let's get this baby opened up. So, accessories box first, because I always tease you guys like that. Here we go, lots of accessories. This is a high-end board, so it has all the accessories. So this is that uh, Bluetooth module, okay? This is our three-way SLI bridge. Here's our two-way, oh, or rather crossfire bridge. Here's our two-way SLI bridge. We're gonna put those all together. This didn't seem organized right to me. All right, we've got some zip ties. We've got the Q connectors. We've also got um, voltage checkpoints, so Probit, quick installation thing, so you can check the voltages, and we'll cover that when we have a look at the board itself. IO shield, couple temp probes, three to be exact. Uh, Maximus 4 Extreme User Guide, including a sticker, an installation DVD, as well as labels for your SATA cables, so you can keep track of which are which once you've already routed them in your case. Finally, exclusive feature guide, so ROG Connect, RFC Bluetooth, and ROG iDirect overclocking from your iPhone. Next, I'm expecting them to include a utility that lets you overclock your iPhone. Got that weird case sticker, the big huge one that I did eventually find someone who had installed it on their case. So that was, uh, that was interesting. Next, we've got the ROG Connect cable, which is a USB cable with ROG stamped on it, essentially. Okay, we've got four SATA 3 6 gigabit per second cables, which are only different from the other ones and the fact that they're white. They're all right angle. And then we have four more right angle SATA 2 connectors. We have rear USB 2.0 bracket, and that is it for the accessories. Now, let's close that back up and have a look at the board itself. So, ASUS has had the whole Republic of Gamers color scheme thing just figured out for a while now. I mean, look at this, this looks fantastic. Oh, you're in the light, cameraman, way to go. All right, so from that angle, this should look pretty darn impressive, which is what it looks like in person. So why don't we start at the middle of the board? Here's our LGA1155 socket, surrounded by the Digi Plus VRM. So you can see here that they're using a fairly different looking design for the, for the voltage regulation modules. Remember that clean voltage to your CPU is very important for achieving the highest possible overclocks. We've also got, I mean, they've done such a good job of these on the last few generations of boards. Really neat looking MOSFET heat sinks, as well as the heat pipes that tie them into the North Bridge heat sink, and then uh, nothing connected, but you can see that the South Bridge heat sink is stylized similarly as well. Now, I do know they're not called North Bridge and South Bridge anymore, but I'm old school like that. You're not gonna break that habit. Sorry, guys. All right, we've got our eight pin power connector up here at the top of the board, right where it belongs, top left ideal location. Now, we don't have dual 8 pins, but I would go as far as to say that's completely unnecessary on a P67 board. All right, we've got, uh, let's move this way. So we have four DDR3 
slots supporting dual channel. These are the easy install slots, so they only have clips on the one side. You put your module in like this, then you clip it closed. All right, we've got built-in start and reset switches. We have liquid nitrogen mode switch on and off, so that might be handy if you're benchmarking with liquid nitrogen. This, this is smart. This is a much better place for the post LED because you can actually see this when you have graphics cards installed. Love it. Start, reset. Also, we have the PCIe 16X switches. These I'm a big fan of as well, if, especially if you have water cooling installed, full cover blocks, it can be a real pain to troubleshoot which card is on the fritz. So you can turn off your PCIe lanes and boot to whichever card you want. Here are all the v uh, voltage checkpoints. So we have RAM, CPU, uh, NF200 chip even, uh, PCH PLL, uh, PCH, CPU IO, CPU PLL, CPU, oh sorry, this is uh, CPU SA. All right, moving down, we have the go button. We have a 24 pin power connector in its ideal location along the right hand edge of the board. We have SATA IO, so do, 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 the red ones. Red ones are SATA 3, 6 gigabit per second. These ones are running off the Intel chipset. These ones are running off a third party chipset. These are SATA 2, 3 gigabit per second. And since this is a B3 revision board, they are not affected by the bug that affected the original P67 boards. Here's a BIOS switch. So we have two dedicated hardware BIOS chips. You can save one set of settings in the other one. And then if you're experimenting, you can switch over to your other BIOS, boot up to that one, and then play around with whatever it is you want to do. Here's all your front panel connectors. Moving right along, we've got clear CMOS somewhere. There's a little arrow pointing somewhere. Not sure what in the heck. Okay, you know what? Just don't. One to two disable, enable. One to two to three disable. Two clear CMOS. I don't, I don't know what this does. Okay, forget it. Okay, we've got four USB 2.0 front panel headers because they didn't really have any room for them on the back since it's full of USB 3. A couple fan headers. We've got a couple of easy plugs. So one, Two easy plugs, so if you are installing a ton of graphics cards, I would definitely recommend using those because they will help provide some supplementary power to your cards. We have one, two, three, four, four PCIe 16X slots. Uh, they are all wired for, no, hold on. One, two, three of them are wired for 16X. So those ones are gonna be running off the NF200 chip. This one is only wired for 8X. So if you install three cards, you're gonna be using up this, this, and this. You will have no room for additional expansion cards. Now this one right here is PCIe 1X. Uh, that one's going to have full bandwidth regardless. This is a PCIe 4X that's running off the chipset. So that one will have full bandwidth regardless of what you install in all these slots. So these are going to run in... Uh, I could check the manual, but I'm just going to guess. Correct me if I'm wrong. Should be 16, 16, 16. Or it could also be 8, 8, 8, 8. But you can't run four-way SLI or Crossfire anyway, so I don't really see the point of doing that. Unless you're folding. Folding at home. Okay. USB 3.0 rear panel header. So that's an interesting location for that. I guess if you're going to put like a PCI bracket in, that would be useful. And then finally, I think that's pretty much it. So here's where the Bluetooth module installs, the one that was in the packaging. And one more thing, back out from the board. So this is not a standard ATX board, like many Republic of Gamers boards in the past. It is slightly wider, so an ATX board would end right here. This board ends right here. So while you don't need an eATX case, you do need an ATX case uh, that is a little bit wider than the farther, far right most mounting holes to make sure that you'll be able to install this board. Now, another thing I want to talk about is we have one, two, three, four. Oh, here, back out because you're not going to be able to see where I'm pointing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. PWM fan headers on this motherboard. So you can plug in a ton of fans to this motherboard without overloading it. All right, let's have a look at the back IO plate. Last but not least, we've got a PS2, US, a PS2 keyboard mouse combo port, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight USB 3.0 ports, two eSATA ports, a clear CMOS switch, optical audio out, two Intel, gigabit network connections. So these are not using third-party controllers. We have the ROG Connect button as well as the ROG Connect port, as well as 7.1 audio out. On the back of the board, we find a couple of heat sinks for the MOSFETs. So those are gonna give you an additional little bit of heat dissipation on the back of the board. And also of note is the fact that all of the heat sinks on this motherboard are using screws, spring-loaded screws with plastic washers to ensure no shorting out and also no disengaging like you can have happen from time to time with those plastic clips. Thank you for checking out this unboxing of the Maximus 4 Extreme. Don't forget to subscribe to Linus Tech Tips. Oh, the sun's in my eyes. For more unboxings, reviews, 
reviews and other computer videos.